You're listening to episode nine of the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, we're going to talk about how to use your pursuit of health to honor God while creating your healthiest physical body. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm a registered dietitian and coach trained in functional medicine with a passion for helping women just like you ditch perfectionism and use food, fitness, and self-care to fuel your bigger God-given purpose. I believe that it's possible to achieve your biggest life-changing goals without the frustration, obsession, or negative self-talk that so many women subject themselves to every day. All you need are the right tools, the right mindset, and the faith to turn your dreams into reality. I'm here to guide you along the way. The truth is that you are so much more than a body, and I'm on a mission to help you change the way you think and act at a core beliefs level so you can transform your physical, mental, and spiritual health from the inside out. Are you ready to become fed and fearless in your pursuit of a healthy, meaningful life? Welcome to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm your host as always. And I'm so excited for this episode today because this is really one of the first ones that I've recorded that is far more faith-based than some of the other ones we've had so far. So if you're still here with me, if you're listening to the podcast every week, you know that one of my goals with this show is to combine our faith and our relationship with God with our approach to our physical health. And I hope that every episode I record is one that allows you to do that. But this one especially is going to start digging into the faith piece because something that I've realized over the course of the last six or seven years working with women in my nutrition business, and then also just communicating with women online through Facebook and Instagram and my newsletter is that not a lot of women are talking about health in relationship to our relationship with God. And it's something that I have a lot of friends in the industry that we talk about it and we have conversations about it, but we all agree that this is something that does not get talked about anywhere near enough in the world of health and especially in the world of ancestral health and, um, you know, holistic health, that kind of thing. So I'm excited to bridge that gap and to really start talking about our bodies as they are um, creations of God and also operating in a physical world. So That's what really the theme of this whole podcast is, and I'm excited that this episode is going to dive a little bit more into that. So this past weekend, I spent basically the whole weekend working on a new ebook that you all actually can download now if you go to fedandfearless.com forward slash ebook. So that's E-B-O-O-K. You can actually get a hold of this 83 page ebook. It's it sounds longer than it is. It's there's a lot of images and um, things that you can use as like um, you know printouts and that kind of thing. So don't worry about it being super content heavy and and boring. But it is an 83 page ebook that I wrote this weekend about how to honor God with our health. And I wanted to talk about it on the show today because it is such a big deal when it comes to the way we as Christian women approach our health, think about our bodies, and plan our food and fitness routine. And the way that I want to kick this off is talking about the concept of our bodies being a temple. I'm sure that you've heard the phrase, your body's a temple. Um, It's something that's super common And even non-Christian people use it as a reason to spend a ton of time on their diet and exercise routine. And the truth is that most Christian women do think that treating their body like a temple is the best way to get physically and spiritually healthy. But viewing your body as a temple could actually hurt you in the long run. Now, I don't want to freak anybody out. I know that the phrase, your body is a temple, is in the Bible. So it's easy to believe that God wants us to treat our bodies like a temple. I get it. But if that were true, wouldn't everyone who spent hours worrying about their diet, planning their meals, and hitting the gym be the most physically and spiritually healthy people? And we all know that that's not the case. In fact, if you keep holding on to this belief, you might not only harm your physical health, but your spiritual health may suffer as well. But 
Do you want to know how you can actually improve both your physical and spiritual health at the same time? You start treating your body like a home, not a temple. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So there it is right there, right? Your body is a temple. But did you know that the word temple in Greek is also translated as a sanctuary or a divine dwelling place? When the Bible calls our body a temple, it's specifically saying that it is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us. God is saying that our bodies are a home for his spirit and that we should honor God with the way that we take care of our bodies. Because the fact is, your body is God's sacred home. That's what it means to be a temple. I want you to think about the way that you care for your home, your physical home that you live in. Do you think it would be honoring to God if you spend all your time, all your money, and all your resources making your home look beautiful and perfect? Or would it be more honoring to him to take care of your home within reason? So that way you can use your home as an opportunity to fulfill the purpose God created you for, whether that's raising your family, connecting with your community, or working on your career. It would also be hard to use your home to honor God if it was falling apart. If the roof was leaking, if the hot water heater was broken, or if there's just junk all over the place. And let me tell you, I know what that means. We just moved into our new house recently, and for a long time, there was stuff everywhere, just boxes and um, hardly any furniture. And that was not a place that I felt comfortable bringing people into my home, having community meet there, or you know, really getting anything done. But the fact is, your home does not need to be spotless and decorated like a scene out of Pinterest in order to use it to serve God's purpose in your life. Your body is the exact same way. Your body is a home for your spirit and the Holy Spirit to live in. Really, it's a vehicle to pursue your purpose. And caring for it is important when it comes to living your most spiritually healthy life. But obsessing over it and trying to make it perfect, spending hours planning and executing the perfect diet and exercise routine, and using the excuse that your body is a temple as a reason why you're so anxious about doing everything right. This is the exact opposite of how God wants you to treat your body. Your body is your home. It deserves appropriate care and maintenance so it can thrive. But it's not meant to be worshipped and obsessed over. It's not meant to give you fear and anxiety if it's not in the perfect condition. And it's also not meant to be neglected. To honor God with your body means to respect and care for your body in a way that allows you to pursue your kingdom purpose that God created you for. So let me ask you, do you really want to keep thinking that your body is a temple and spend your whole life obsessing and worrying about the health of your body? Or do you want to learn how to treat your body like a home and use your pursuit of good health to fuel your bigger God-given purpose? Now, I assume if you're still here with me, you want to use your health to fuel your purpose. So let's talk about how we can give God glory in the way that we care for our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 10 31, Paul writes, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So it's right there in the Bible that we're supposed to use our food, our beverages, and really everything that we do to give God glory. So why not our health? Why is that something that we don't always associate with something that we can give God glory in? I think it's because when we think about pursuing optimal health, we're usually thinking about it from a self-centered perspective. I get it. We want to look better, feel better, move better, perform better in the gym. There's a lot of things that we have goals around when it comes to our health that are really pretty self-centered. But as followers of Jesus, we're commanded to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. So how does the pursuit of good health play into our first and greatest commandment? How do we pursue good health to the glory of God? Listen, I do not pretend to speak for God. His ways are totally higher than my ways. And I'm sure that once my soul is reunited with him, I'll have a lot of questions about how things operated while I was on earth. But I'm confident that we can pursue health to the glory of God. After all, Paul says it himself in 1 Corinthians 10 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That means the food we eat and the beverages we drink can either be glorifying to God or not. So let's talk about what it means to pursue health for the glory of God. 
God gets the most glory when we serve and care for others in his name. So how does caring for your health allow you to do that? I think there are two main ways that caring for your own health affects others. First, when you're in good health, it's far easier to serve others than when you're sick. Now, listen, there is no shame in dealing with any illness, of course. But imagine if every single person on earth was dealing with some kind of significant illness that inhibited their ability to function normally. Who would care for all these people? The fact is the world needs healthy and physically fit people who are willing to care for those who are less fortunate when it comes to their physical health. That means we need to use our health to help others in any way that we can. Second, being in good health allows you to pursue whatever purpose God created you for. Maybe you're healthy enough to give birth to children who you can raise up to love and serve God. Maybe your mind is sharp enough to pursue a career that allows you to make an impact on the world. Or maybe your body is strong enough to engage in physical labor that helps others in time of need. I think about people like firefighters. If there weren't people who were strong and healthy that could fight fires, then whenever there was a fire, we'd be in a little bit of trouble. So whatever God's plans for you, it's easy to see how a healthy body can support your pursuit of his kingdom purpose in your life. Now, I want you to ask yourself, is your mindset around food and fitness glorifying to God? Are you caring for your body so that you can use your good health to serve others and to expand his kingdom? Or is your main priority with your health habits for your own glory, to look better naked and to pursue your own selfish ambitions? I know that can sound harsh, but this is your opportunity for a heart check when it comes to your own mindset around your physical goals. While there's nothing wrong with eating and exercising in a way that helps you look your best, Be careful that your own personal vanity goals aren't clouding your ability to be obedient to God's guidance in your life. As long as your health is helping you pursue your relationship with God and fulfill his purpose in your life, you can be certain it's a good thing to spend time and energy focusing on. Now, I want to talk about a story in the Bible that actually my husband recommended that I share with you guys, because um, this one is one that tends to hit close to home. I'm sure many of you have heard it. It's the story of Mary and Martha. And I want you, while we talk about this story, I want you to think about if you're a Mary or a Martha when it comes to the way that you take care of your health. Now, if you don't know the story of Mary and Martha, I definitely encourage you to go check it out in your Bible, whether that's online or um, in a physical real Bible. But if you do know it, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Mary and Martha are sisters who open their home to Jesus as he's traveling with his disciples. And you can imagine the scene where Jesus and 12 men, maybe there's more of them, come into this home and Martha is on it. She's rushing around trying to make sure that their home is completely prepared for their guests. She's probably cooking and cleaning and setting the table and um, making sure that everybody's got their feet washed because that feet washing was a thing back then. She's just um, going straight into type A mode, like making sure everybody's taken care of. Now, unlike Martha, Mary is simply sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him talk and soaking in his wisdom. Now, I know that if you're like me, you hear this story and you're like, oh my gosh, Mary, what are you doing? But I promise that there's a point. So Martha gets frustrated that she's been left to take care of everything in the home. So she says to Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus replies to Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, if this doesn't cut right to the heart of a perfectionist, I don't know what will. And honestly, there's a big part of me that really wants to argue with Jesus when I read this story. I want to tell him, well, Jesus, someone has to make sure the home is taken care of. I mentioned this fact to my husband, and he had quite the chuckle. He thought it was hilarious. I was like, listen, I really feel very strongly that... Martha is doing something that's really important. But the fact is that Jesus is not saying that we need to completely ignore the needs of day-to-day life. Obviously, if there's a bunch of guys that just came in from travel, they probably need to eat. They probably need to clean up a little bit. So making sure that they're taken care of is not necessarily a bad thing. 
What he is saying, however, is that connecting with him is the most important and best choice that we can make, even in the face of other things that are going on in our life. So when it comes to choosing how to best care for your body, I want you to always make that decision in light of how it affects your relationship with Jesus. So some things to think about here would be, you know, things like your fitness routine. If you're getting up at five o'clock in the morning to make sure you hit the gym in the morning, but you're not having any quiet time with Jesus during the day, or you're not reading your Bible, are you being a Martha in that situation? Or maybe when it comes to your food choices, you're so concerned about making sure that everything's super clean and 100% aligned with whatever diet that you're on, that you actually avoid spending time with people. Like maybe you don't go to a small group or you don't go out to dinner with your friends because you're just, you don't like not having control over your food. So is that being a Martha or is that being a Mary? Because if we think about it, our greatest two commandments are to love God the way we love ourselves and to love others the way we love ourselves and actually really love God above the way we love ourselves. I want to correct that. Um, So if those are our two commandments, I want you to think about is your health pursuit actually contributing to those goals or is it taking you away from those goals? Is it distracting you from prayer or uh, studying scripture or journaling in, you know, just journaling about your day and, and talking to God about it? Is it something where you're at the gym so frequently that you don't even have time to spend with your community? We just had a great episode with my client, Natalie, where she talked about the way that her fitness routine was cutting into her um, ability to spend time with people. And that's something that does get in the way of our relationship with God and our ability to fulfill his purpose. So again, this is really just a heart check for you. I've been there before. Um, I still struggle with this now, maybe not so much with my health choices, but with a lot of things, life can get busy and it's really easy to start focusing on the things that we think are more important. And it's unfortunately very easy to say, oh, I'll, I'll read the Bible later, or I don't have to pray right now because I have to get things done. So I just really want you all to start thinking about Are your food and fitness choices actually getting in the way of you developing your relationship with God, or are they something that is helping you improve your relationship with God? And I think another point that I really want to drive home to you all today is looking at this from an actual physical health perspective as well, because I get it. Like, I think there's a lot of people out there who are worried about their bodies. They're worried about their health choices. We live in an environment where there is a lot of food that's not great for us around. Or, you know, even when we think about exercise, it's a lot easier to not exercise than it is to be consistent with an exercise routine. So our environment is really set up for us to not be healthy. We've created this for ourselves. This isn't something that God created and we have to fight against. It's something that has really become an issue in the last century or so where um, our own human intervention and in just creation has created this environment where food is plentiful, lots of really delicious, craveable food is available. And we also have created a lifestyle that doesn't really require much physical labor. So there is a lot of decisions we have to make about our health. And I understand it can start to feel overwhelming and anxiety inducing when you're trying to make these decisions and there's just a ton of information available on the internet. Um, Something that one of my actually business mentors mentioned on his podcast recently, James Wedmore, he said something about how we don't have an information problem pretty much in anything, but he was talking about with business. We don't have an information problem. We have an implementation problem. We have a putting it into practice problem. So something that I see in a lot of the women I work with is that they have so much information available to them to the point where they're really in information overload. And what happens is they try to make decisions about how to take care of their bodies and they're just freaking out. They're like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I want to try this or should I try that? Or, you know, should I exercise more? Should I exercise less? Should I eat more vegetables, less vegetables? Like there are so many different decisions we can make when it comes to our health that it can feel exhausting and overwhelming. And it kind of forces us into the state where we're either obsessed with our bodies or we're just completely paralyzed and we stop taking care of our bodies altogether. And 
whether or not you're a Christian, I'm hope I, I assume at this point, if you're still listening to this episode that you're a Christian, but whether or not you're a Christian, having that mindset around health is not the best way to achieve good health. Even if you improve your health physically, that kind of mindset is something that is definitely going to have negative impacts on your mental health. And then as as Christians, we have to think about our spiritual health as well. So if you're constantly worried about your body, if you're overly consumed with what are you eating that day and what's your exercise routine and are you getting to bed on time? Are you drinking enough water? Are you taking the right supplements? Are you, you know, eating too much sugar? Are you having too much caffeine? All of these questions that we can potentially ask ourselves, if you're doing that in lieu of thinking about your spiritual health or in lieu of learning about God and who he is and what he says about you and what he says your purpose is and what he says, um, you know, is going to happen to us when we die because we're all going to die. If you're avoiding learning about that stuff because you're so overwhelmed with all of these health decisions, then you are really having negative impacts on your spiritual health. And then when it comes to your physical health, what I see happening in a lot of cases is, again, it's either that obsessiveness or that paralysis that comes from having too much information and trying to make too many decisions at once. Something that I am committed to teaching my students in Fed and Fearless and also my private clients is this idea that we can do the least amount possible to have the best results in our health. And I feel like from a spiritual perspective, that's actually a really important way to think about our bodies. What is the least we can do to take care of this gift of a body that God gave us without it becoming something that is truly an idol? I I actually think that we can think about a lot of the areas of our life that we struggle with or that we are working towards goals in in this same way. So um, finances, I think, are a great example of something that a lot of people deal with and maybe a lot of people struggle with, or at least we think about a lot. I mean, even if you're doing well financially, most people at least are um, working towards financial goals or making decisions around how to budget their money, how to spend their money. And so if you are constantly worried about your money and, uh, and just having all this anxiety about your money, constantly checking your bank account, afraid about every dollar that you spend, um, not being generous because you are just so worried about your financial state that you don't feel comfortable being generous with other people, or maybe you're not um, tithing or, or sharing money with your church because you're worried about your finances. That is not an honoring way to Uh, work towards financial health. And that's not honoring to God in the way that you're caring for your finances. So I look at our physical health the same way, because if we're worried about it all the time, we're going to be making decisions based out of fear, based out of anxiety. And a lot of the times those are not decisions that are actually beneficial to our health. Just to use the money thing as an example, how many people do you know that make really positive money decisions based on a fear of going broke or based on the worry that they won't be able to pay their bills? I don't really know too many people that have that mindset. In fact, the people that I know that are the most um just best with money are the people that I look up to as far as how they handle their money. They have a very confident attitude and a trust that even if they make some decisions that are not the best, that that doesn't mean that everything's going to just crumble. Right. I mean, and I've, I've talked to some people before who have had some pretty um, up and down experiences with their finances. And at the end of the day, they realize that they have only so much control over what happens financially. They can't control the economy. They can't control um, if they're if they get fired from their job. They can't control if um, even the exchange rate changes. Like there's so many things that they don't have control over. So what they focus on is what do I have control over, and what kind of decisions can I make that would be honoring to God with the way that I care for my finances. And the crazy thing is a lot of times making, well, I shouldn't say it's crazy, but the funny thing is when you see these people making decisions about their finances aligned with God's word and in a way that they feel would be honoring to God, a lot of times that is actually what leads to them creating the healthiest financial state for themselves. And I, like I said, I want to just always bring this back to how this affects us from a physical health perspective. So if you are thinking about your health goals in a way that is, how is this honoring to God? 
Is it honoring to God to not exercise at all? Is it honoring to God to go to the gym seven days a week, maybe twice a day? Um, I don't think either of those are honoring to God, but is it honoring to God to move your body in a way that helps you feel strong and energetic and maybe um, gets you outside enjoying nature and allows you to be active with your family, like your kids? If that's a yes, then that is something that's honoring to God with your food. Is it honoring to God to be terrified about eating anything outside the home or only eat food that's super, super clean and and research every single ingredient before you put it in your mouth or um, spend all your money on getting like organic and wild caught and um, grass fed meat and everything like that? Or on the flip side, is it honoring to God to eat donuts and cookies and Um, Taco Bell all day. Like if that was your choice for your food, would that be honoring the body that God gifted you with? Again, these are both ends of the extreme, but I would argue that neither of those approaches are honoring to God. So there is a middle ground. There's a way to approach our food and fitness choices in a way that honors God. And that's going to be different for everybody. It's something where there's, there are people that have food sensitivities, like let's say somebody who has celiac disease and they absolutely can't eat gluten. Then yes, it is actually honoring to God if they're strict about avoiding gluten because they know that their body needs that avoidance to function at its best. And they don't want to have chronic illness. They don't want to be in the bathroom all the time. They don't want to be going to doctor's appointments all the time. They don't want to be malnourished because they're not absorbing nutrients because their gut's messed up from eating the gluten. So In that situation, 100% gluten avoidance, yes, that's honoring to God and um, somebody who needs to make that decision can feel good about that decision. On the flip side, somebody who is being super strict gluten-free because they read on a blog somewhere that gluten is going to kill us all and even though they've never had a negative side effect from eating gluten and they have no medical evidence that gluten's a problem for them, they still are just neurotic about avoiding gluten to the point of uh, they won't go to a small group because people don't eat gluten-free or they don't want to go out to eat with friends because, again, they don't have control over the menu or um, they spend all their time researching gluten and researching nutrition and that kind of thing as opposed to spending time reading the Bible or praying. So again, it's not that the individual food itself, eating it or avoiding it is honoring or not honoring to God, it's that our motive for the decision and how much emphasis we put on that decision that affects whether or not it's honoring to God. There's actually an interesting part of the Bible where Paul talks about, he's talking about this from more of like a a spiritual perspective. In the Old Testament, there was a lot of rules about food and kosher law and everything like that. So For context, I'm not obviously a biblical scholar, so I'm not going to tell you all the rules that there were. But as an example, um, you weren't supposed to eat shellfish. You're not supposed to eat pork. You're not supposed to eat food that was sacrificed to an idol that wasn't like something that was blessed by a priest, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of rules about food. Some of them, I think, were more hygienic rules, but other of them were more um, like rules that were just more for keeping us spiritually healthy. Now, after Jesus came and died and was resurrected, those rules were basically, it says the law was fulfilled. So those rules were no longer something that needed to guide our decision-making. We could eat shellfish. We could have a bacon wrap scallop and that's totally fine from God's perspective. But there was a lot of argument in the church about what's allowed, what's not allowed with this new freedom that we were given from Jesus's um, death and resurrection. A lot of people were using that as an excuse to do things that were really not good for them. Um, In the part of the Bible that I'm talking about, Paul's really talking more about, um, I think he's really talking more about um, sexual sin and, and like having sex with a lot of people and that kind of thing. But I think we can apply this to our food choices as well, because there are certain food choices that if we're doing them excessively, that's not good for us. Or even with exercise, if we're not exercising at all and we're just laying around all day, that's not good for us either. So the part of the Bible that I'm talking about is 1 Corinthians six twelve, And in this section, um, Paul writes, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So again, what 
what Paul's saying here is that we aren't bound by this law anymore, but that there are certain behaviors that benefit from some discipline and some responsibility and moderation or even abstinence. So again, everybody's in a different place here. I can think about something like alcohol where some of us can enjoy smaller amounts of alcohol and that's not a problem. It's not necessarily bad for our health. It's not something that we're using as an emotional or spiritual crutch. But some people, they really can't have alcohol. They really find that alcohol is not a good thing for them and they choose to abstain from it. So alcohol is a great example of there being gray area where for some people drinking is not spiritually healthy and for others, it's either neutral or it's fine. So again, these behaviors, even though they're permissible, they're not necessarily beneficial for us to be engaging in either regularly or sometimes we shouldn't be um, engaging in them at all. So I think about things like um, extramarital sex, sleeping around a lot, really not the healthiest thing for us, but having sex within the context of marriage, that is God's design and that is what's healthy for us. So again, there's gray area. Everybody's going to have their own opinion about what's beneficial, what's not. But what we really want to think about is what are your habits when it comes to your health and are they positively or negatively affecting your health, whether that's your physical health, your spiritual health, your mental health. Because again, avoiding certain foods could be really important for you, or it could be creating a lot of mental um, dysfunction and anxiety and fear and shame and um, just a lot of negative self-talk. So I know there's so much that I could talk about about this, and I want to make sure I'm not going all over the place with this conversation. Um, I just have a lot of thoughts in my head after writing this whole ebook and talking about a lot of this stuff. So like I said, if you're interested in learning more about this overall topic in general, about the idea of honoring God with your health, definitely check out my brand new ebook. It's literally called Honoring God with Your Health, and you can get it at fedandfearless.com forward slash ebook. And in it, we talk more about um, how to honor God with your health, of course, and how to start trusting God with your health, because a lot of um, a lot of these fear based decisions around our health are made because we don't trust God with our health. We think it's up to us to take care of our bodies 100 percent and everything that happens to us is our responsibility. We also talk about how to start developing just self-love because I think a lot of women, um, they say they're focused on health, but really they're focused on self-improvement or changing who they are or um, trying to be someone that they wish they were, that kind of mindset. We also talk about how to be healthy for God's glory, some of the stuff that we already talked about, but just thinking about how our food and fitness choices can not only improve our physical well-being, but also improve our relationship with God. So um, this has been fun. I am excited to have more conversations about this kind of thing. I think, um, you know, I'd love to hear questions about it. We do have an option of submitting a voice message to me if you're interested. If you have a question or you have a topic you want me to cover, I would love to hear from you. And uh, the link to submit a voice message is in the notes for this episode. So go to my website, lauraschoenfeldrd.com to check it out and check out the show notes for this episode as well as pretty much any episode that's on the website now will have that link to the voice messages. So anyway, I <laughs> I could ramble on about this stuff for a long time. Um I want to continue the conversation as always online. You can DM me on Instagram to let me know what you think and download that ebook. Take a look at it, read through it and connect with me um, either, like I said, on Instagram, Facebook, or we have our Fed and Fearless Society free Facebook group. The link to that is in the ebook as well. I'd love for you to come join us and we can chat more about how your faith affects your food and fitness choices and how it affects the way that you care for your body. So anyway, I know that was a lot of information. Um, I, I'm i definitely going to go into each of these individual areas in more depth in the future. But for now, what I want you to remember is that God loves you, that he created your body to be a vehicle to pursue your purpose. And it is your responsibility to care for your body to the best of your ability. But just don't turn your body into an idol. Don't make your body more important than yourself, who you are, who God called you to be, and definitely don't make it more important than God himself. It's not going to lead you to better health. It's not going to lead you to 
be happy and joyful and uh, feeling fulfilled. And my goal with every single podcast episode is to help you understand how to approach your health in a way that is using your faith in God to feel confident and to feel happy with who you are and to feel joy in your behaviors and to really feel like you're walking out the path that God has put before you um, to the best of your ability. So all of that said, thanks for hanging out with me today. Um, I would love to hear from you. What did you think about this conversation? Do you have any further questions for me? And I'm super excited next week's episode, we're going to have another interview with one of my fed and fearless coaching clients talking more about these topics. So I hope you'll join us and I'll see you there. And I hope you have a really great rest of your week. Take care, everybody. Are you a Christian woman who wants to learn how to replace negative self-talk with healthy spiritual truths so you can honor God with the way you care for your body? Then I have a special invitation for you. Starting on Monday, December 30th, I'm hosting a special five-day body confidence challenge called Faith Over Fear. In this challenge, I'll walk you through the five most important steps you need to take in order to eliminate negative self-talk and develop a faith-centered approach to food and fitness that creates confidence and positivity in your body. To register, go to fedandfearless.com forward slash challenge and sign up now. We officially start on December 30th, and you don't want to miss any part of this challenge if you can help it. So go to fedandfearless.com forward slash challenge to grab your spot. You'll get instant access to the challenge program, as well as an invitation to our exclusive private Facebook group where we'll be hosting everyone who's participating. I can't wait to help you use food and fitness to fuel your purpose. I'll see you there.